Hi, I'm Nadia Combs, Chair of the Hillsborough County School Board. I want to welcome you to Hillsborough County Public Schools. We serve more than 200,000 students. That includes children in preschool through adults in our workforce program. I'm Henry Shake Washington, the Board Vice Chair. Our district is the seventh largest in America, and our team is made up of more than 24,000 people working at nearly 250 sites across the county. Our district is diverse and dedicated. Our board meetings are held in our board auditorium on select Tuesdays at 4 p.m. The best way to serve our students and our community is to involve you, the public, in what we do. You are welcome to email or meet with any of our board members and follow our district on social media. Board meetings are covered live by Hillsborough Schools TV on Spectrum Cable Channel 635 and Frontier Cable Channel 32. Meetings are also streamed live on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Closed captioning is provided on all broadcasts and past meetings are available in our online archive. We are interested in what the public has to say. We'll include time for audience comments before we address our business items. Our agenda and any supporting materials can be viewed online in advance. They are posted seven days before each meeting on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Our vision is preparing students for life. And that means all students, every day. Todos los estudiantes, todos los días. Thank you for your interest in education. With your help, we're making decisions that shape our community's future. The board meeting of February 9, 2023, 2023 is called to order. Member Washington will now lead us in a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please join with me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Now please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. <clears throat> Member Washington will now please acknowledge our student entertainment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to thank the Barrington uh, Thunderbolt Jazz Ensemble along with the band director, Mr. David Triplett Rosa and the principal, Mrs. Andrea Whitman. Now, will these wonderful students please come up and introduce yourselves? Boy, y'all look sharp. Parker Cervetti. Javier Gallandrino. Mason Stedlin. John Raises. Eva Schneider. Lena Berry. Angel Gomez. Nina Ruffner. Scott Montgomery. Ethan Tay. Madeline Quasson. Andre Saylor. Jayla Anderson. Anthony Tickles. Nye Alexandre. Luke Santangelo. Thomas Carmona. Eli Taylor. Evan Warfield. Sydney Morris. Matan Zord. Ethan Wizard. Julian Greco. Tommy Krasinski. Seisha Nagahara. Kid Frederick Jogue. Kyle Panak. Aiden Goodall. Sophia Morales. Layla Hernandez. Alistair Pineda. Abby Ramsey. Emily Hultimus. Band director David Triplerosa. Okay, thank you. And if you have any parents who want to take pictures, please do so. Yeah, come up.
Thank you. Congratulations for doing a great job. Yes, thank you, students. So you played amazing today. It was just such a great way to start our meeting. Thank you. Make sure uh, y'all tell your director to give them one of green ties, okay? <laughs> you have to play an instrument. Oh, okay. You have to play the saxophone did. or something. Uh, we have one withdrawn item today, 102 Soul Source 2291 SSD SK Zan Education Incorporated for the purchase of supplemental civics literacy books. I need a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. I have a motion by Member Gray, and I have a second by Member Washington. Any discussion? Please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. Let the record reflect that all board members are present today. Board members, I'd like to go over the format of today's meeting. As a reminder, we're a nonpartisan board who believe that all children can be empowered to learn to succeed, and our decisions will be made with that understanding. To pave the way for efficient and effective agenda statements and or questions, board members will have three minutes to speak, actually five minutes to speak because we changed that, with 30 seconds for final thoughts. Afterward, the superintendent can respond. If you have further questions, you're asked to get back into the queue. Member Washington will now read the board guidelines. Thank you, Madam Chair. As we begin this afternoon meeting, let me quickly review the format of our school board meetings. Please silence all electronic devices. There are speakers in the room behind me that allow board members to hear the meeting upon stepping away from the dais. This meeting can be viewed with closed caption on live webcasts, on cable TV, and on video monitors here in the auditorium. It also can be viewed with closed caption in the online video archives. Thank you, Member Washington. We have one item scheduled for time certain. That's the 6 o'clock, and that's employee input. At this time, we'll be moving up our recognition. AO2, the National PTA Schools of Excellence designation. Member Vond will be highlighting this recognition. Thank you, Madam Chair. National PTA School of Excellence recognition program opens the lines of communication and critical thinking within school communities to make data-driven decisions that yield positive long-term results. School of Excellence is committed to supporting and recognizing partnerships between local PTSAs and schools to enrich the educational experience and overall well-being for all students. The School of Excellence programs aims to provide a framework for PTAs to identify and implement best practices in family engagement to strengthen family school partnerships. Build inclusive and welcoming school communities where all families contribute to enriching the educational experience and overall well-being for all students. And help PTAs attract new action-oriented PTA members who want to focus on the issues that affect our children the most. The 2021 to 2023 National PTA Schools of Excellence are designated in recognition of their commitment to building an inclusive and welcoming school community where all families contribute to enriching the educational experience and overall well-being for all students. With only 242 School of Excellence designees nationwide and only 34 in the state of Florida, Hillsborough County has 12 School of Excellent PTA PTSA designees. Congratulations to the local units in Hillsborough County that earned the designation for the 2021 to 2023 school year. We ask that you please stand when your school is called. Martinez Middle School PTSA, Steinbrenner High School PTSA, Grady Elementary PTA, Knights Elementary PTA, Leonard High School PTSA, Lowry Elementary PTA, McFarland Park PTA, Mulrennan Middle School PTSA, Northwest Elementary PTA, 
Davison Middleton, PTSA, Robinson High School, PTSA, and McKittrick Elementary, PTA. I'd also like to acknowledge the Hillsborough County PTA, PTSA members. Please stand at this time as well. Amy Marie Granger Welch, Erica Hamblin, Norma Mays, Ellen Lyons, Quan Remmer, Annette O'Malley, and Valerie Lycata. And if I said your name wrong, I apologize. Thank you so much and congratulations! <laughs> Woo! You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. We won't be voting on this, but um, members, if you'd like to make a comment, we'll start with Member Gray. <clears throat> Speaking on behalf of the board and our superintendent, we could not be more blessed to have such wonderful, hardworking representatives of our parents. Parents are the heartbeat of our schools. And uh, I have to say, from my own experience with Amy Marie Granger's, her commitment to uh, various committees of, uh, of mine just replicate the devotion, the uh, I want to say preparation and delivery to almost 38,000 families. So we think the world of you, you've worked hard, and um, the testimonial is all these wonderful winners. So thank you for everything that you all do, and you, you do so much. Thank you, Ellen Lyons, and so many of you others. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Perez? You know, for me, I have seen the incredible things that you've done to bridge these gaps between the parents, the schools, and our students. I, you go above and beyond. You know, you have some funds that I found out about to assist the parents with the students. You just, just the incredible things that you do. Um, I know as a school board member, Myself, as a, as a grandparent, as a parent, I just thank you for what you do on a daily basis for this district. Thank you. Thank you, Member President. Member Vaughn? Thank you. Yes, I couldn't agree more with my fellow board member's sentiments. I mean, PTAs and PTSAs really can make such a difference in the trajectory of not only the school, but the students in the schools. Um, you know, parental support, all the great things that you guys organize, and as an organization, helping other chapters organize and get started and really teaching them the foundations of um, community engagement and what that looks like is so crucial to the success of our students. So for everybody who's dedicated their time and energy to even your local PTA or the state or even the national. I just hats off. I, we appreciate it so much and congratulations for this. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Rendon? Yeah, I just want to take a minute to just acknowledge the fact that you guys have bridged the gap. You guys have taken parents, students, and teachers and made them a partner in this education that we endeavor, that we all work towards. And so without you, we could not do what we do. Our teachers could not do what they do. Our principals could not do what they do. And so thank you very much for being that bridge that brings it all together and allows us to do what we do and do it well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Member Rendon. Member Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to piggyback off of most what everyone has said, uh, you know, the PTSA and the PTAs are very important in schools because you are the backbone of the school. Um, all the work that's being done outside of the school, mainly the PTSA and the PTA, you really do a great job. And I want to thank you because when I was a principal at Chamberlain High School, the PTSA carried me because they did a great job. They said, shake, oh, you did a great job. But no, the parents and I had support that I needed. And I truly thank you all. And principals, you should be very thankful to have the PTA and PTSAs behind you to help you out. So keep doing a great job and thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Hahn? Thank you, Chair Combs. Well, I, I agree with all of my board members. You all said so many wonderful things. So I can't thank you all enough for what you do across the schools in this district. I know it's a heavy lift for all of us, and we couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Thank you, Member Hahn. And I also, it's just amazing, 12 out of 34 schools in the entire state, 12 of them are in Hillsborough County. That's just amazing. I just want to thank all the parents, you know, we are, we want parent involvement. We need parent involvement. We need mentors. We need people in our schools. And I will say for some of my schools where there hasn't been a PTA, 
There's been people who have stepped up who don't even have students at that school and have created PTAs. I mean, the sacrifice that so many of our community does for all students, regardless if they're in the schools or not the schools, I just want to thank each and every one of them from the bottom of my heart. Even if you're not on this list, it doesn't matter because we know how much work it takes for all these parents and the involvement, and we need parents to make sure that they continue being part of our community, part of our schools. You know, we're opening our schools, and we're happy to have you there. Um, Superintendent Davis? Yes, Mayor of the Chair. I also want to thank the board for making this recognition this evening. It is so important to show that in education, we cannot do this in isolation. And we know that our principals work so hard. We're thankful for you being here. But we're also thanking, thank you for opening your door and allowing parents to be an instrumental part of what we do every single day in education. And at the same token, I mean, you know, our parents have, have starved to come back after COVID. You know, I know we had to put them out and they couldn't get there. They're, you're finding ways to be proactive. But being able to, to allow them us to open the door for them to come in, we need them so much. So thank you so very much, and we look forward to working with Amy to, to expand this initiative so that in every one of our schools has a representation of our community so we can help children every day. So thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. We will now move to public comment, and if those members would like to leave, they can, or just please stay. Um, the board welcomes comments from citizens and values your input to the board. In order to provide the most comprehensive response to your comments, our staff will follow up with you and will keep our board informed about the responses. Our school board respects the public's right to speak to the board, and we appreciate you taking the time to be here. However, it is requested when you address the board comments are not directed personally against a board member or staff member, but rather directed at the issues. Any behavior intended to interrupt the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be allowed. Our civility policy is in place. When addressing the board, please state your name and speak clearly into the microphone. This afternoon, each speaker will have three minutes. Reminder that... Your three minutes starts when you begin speaking. When there are 30 seconds left, you will see a yellow light on the lectern. A red light and chime will indicate when your time is up. I'll now call up the first five speakers. First speaker will please approach. Thank you. Good afternoon, board, Superintendent Davis, administration, staff, parents, everyone who's here. Happy Black History Month. I've been coming before the board for the last several years seeing exactly that and we all know that February each year set aside as Black History Month since 1976. Before that time, and I want to go back just a few years when Mr. Washington and I were students at Booker T. Washington Junior High School and every year, you'll remember Mr. Washington, we celebrated Negro History Week. 1976, it became Black History Month. On behalf of the Tampa Bay History Center, I want to invite all of you, and I think we did send some emails out, uh, to join us on Friday, February 24th. You have the flyers there for our second annual Black History Month reception. One of the things we'll be doing there is recognizing the middle school in Hillsborough County Public School District that uh, won the competition for the Thurgood Marshall History Club this year. And the winner this year Progress Village Middle Magnet School. So Progress Village Middle Magnet School will receive a check. They'll receive recognition on that evening. Uh, I know that the district is going to celebrate that school and the administration, parents, students, the club sponsor for winning this competition. This is only the second year we've had it. And so we're looking forward to that every February at our Black History Month reception at the Tampa Bay History Center, we're going to recognize a middle school uh, for winning the Thurgood Marshall History Club competition. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is this Saturday at Middleton High School, starting at 9 a.m., and I think the ending ceremony will be around 3 o'clock uh, in the afternoon, so it's an all-day activity. We're having the finals for this year's Black History Brain Bowl. HAPSI started this Brain Bowl over seven years ago in Hillsborough County. The district has done a tremendous job of supporting those teachers and others who have been involved in HAPSI. We have, I don't know how many schools now, maybe up to 70 or 80 that participated learning black history facts, having competition, and then we now are at the finals, which will be this Saturday uh, starting at 9 a.m. at Middleton High School. And so I want to encourage you to come out that day sometime between 9 and 3. 
encourage the students, support them. We'd love to see you at Middleton High School, again, 9 o'clock this Saturday. And uh, again, I have more flyers. You can get ticket information on our website at the bottom of the flyer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, Paula Castaño. I'm the advocacy chair at Grady. There will be many speakers today speaking on boundaries. We are united and ask one, not to take a vote in February without all the data. WXYZ's process is flawed. Number two, for an extended deadline with three phases. A few key problems highlighted. Coleman to Pierce, many of those students walk and will cross a highway. Listen to satellite ideas. Number two, Jennings and Greco are newer official community schools and need a minimum of five to eight years with the same leadership to succeed. Three, Carol Wood needs a K-8 school. However, repurposing Adams places two rival gangs at the same school. Next, HB1 happening at the same time is no accident. The bill will decimate our public schools with an initial $4 billion cost. Board, I know you're traveling to Tallahassee. Will you write a letter with Addison's signature and send it to Tallahassee on our behalf? Next, and this is a hot button topic for me. Computerized district level mandated quarterly math test starting at grade one. My daughter spent two days learning to transfer questions from a computer to a paper. It is not developmentally appropriate and it is wrong to align our classroom testing with the star fast testing, particularly with five, six, seven, eight year olds. So I want to change there. I asked Addison, if a paper test could be in front of you when you're a younger child taking the computerized test just for the classroom testing. Board, Addison, please, you must take a stand on something before you fall for everything the state is doing to us, before our public state, our public school system is crushed. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. My name is Stanley Gray, and I'm here representing myself as well as the interest of the Urban League of Hillsborough County, uh, which has a focus on equity uh, throughout the county, especially for its under, underserved uh, citizens. I think if anybody who's actually followed the census changes, we understand that there is a need for boundary changes and, and possibly for school closings. That is undeniable. But the thing that I think that we need to bring into, into, into focus on this is that perceptions as well as facts do matters as we re redefine the boundaries. Uh, when you define these new boundaries, I think that we should make sure that there's everybody is equally inconvenienced. Maybe that's not a real good term, but everyone should be equally inconvenienced. It shouldn't, the, 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 the majority of the pain should not be from the lower social economic classes. And one of the reasons why is that when you add distance and time, one of the things that you get is the lack of parent participation. And so I'd really like for you all to be real mindful as you, as you deal with that. Um, I think that one, that one of the things that really got my attention was about 10 or 15 years ago when there was an addition made on Plant High School. And I always wondered, why are we doing this addition to Plant High School when we have students who live on Davis Island and who live in Harbor Island, why didn't they go to Blake High School? I don't know all the numbers at that time, but I do know now that a lot of the students at Blake, that population is being diminished because of that housing. I thank you for your time, and I wish that you consider my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next speaker, please. Good afternoon. My name is Guilherme Baratti. And I am here once again to ask that the neighborhoods of uh, North Bonaire and West Shore Palms are, con are not considered to be moved from the school districts that we are currently assigned to. I want, I want to thank Ms. Perez, Ms. Gray, Dr. Hun for meeting with the community and listening to our concerns in, in the different meetings we were able to attend. Our area 
has the lowest median income and property value of any areas assigned to plant and common and is now being considered to be removed from that area. Many of the parents, many of the families in that area are first generation homeowners and college graduates and chose that area specifically for the education and how important they saw that for their, their kids. So preparing our kids for our kids' education is not a sprint, it's a long journey. And as parents, we did what we could at the time to prepare for that journey by choosing the schools we wanted our kids to attend. So we, we asked that that choice not be taken away from us. Most families in our area that have school-aged children would relocate, would go to private or charter schools, draining the resources from Hillsborough Public Schools if the changes take effect. We're also working with the Hillsborough Public School Advocates, and we learned about the dismantling of public schools happening in New Orleans and different areas. For our neighborhood, the, the changes, although maybe inadvertently, would have a similar effect with the, with the parents leaving the schools. So we ask from the superintendent, from the board, that consider the areas of North Bonaire and West Shore Palms to remain in the schools they are today. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi there, I'm Danielle Kachi, and this is my daughter, Nina. She's going into kindergarten next year. And um, I also want to thank those of you who are able to come out to the neighborhoods um, and discuss concerns about the school boundaries. We really appreciate it. But um, we are here to implore you to keep us in Grady, Coleman, and Plant. Um, while we live in North Bonaire as well, uh, let me assure you that our neighborhood is not part of the million dollar homes that are on the water or whatever else you think about South Tampa. That's not our neighborhood. Our neighborhood is made up of working class families from all kinds of economic backgrounds and likely has the last ounce of any diversity um, that is left at Coleman and Plant. Families in North Bonaire and West Shore Palms neighborhoods are from black, Hispanic, white, and Asian backgrounds. Um, and by the way, this is the second time uh, I've had to take off work to make it here in time to ensure that um, my voice is heard, but also um, that you're hearing the voices of all of our neighbors who could not make it here today because they are also at work trying very hard to earn a living. My husband and I both attended Plant. Um, we bought our property 12 years ago before we were married, before we had Nina, <laughs> um, in hopes that she would follow in our footsteps one day and also attend Plant. Um, now the future that we've been planning for her is at risk. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are probably thinking, oh, well, it's fine. It's early. She's just going to kindergarten. You don't have to worry about this. There's time to make decisions. but. I'm the mom who started uh, saving away for college when she was just two weeks old. So I'm very concerned. While you go into these boundary workshops next week, uh, we hope that the financials behind these plans are shared um, and explained so that the public and the taxpayers who voted all of you in can better understand what benefit there is to potentially kicking our children out of the schools that they want to attend. And then, Nina, do you want to say something? Please let me go. Oh. Too close. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please. Please let me go to Grady Cohen and Plant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If I can have the next five speakers line up against the wall and the next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Patricia Cannon, and I'm here again to talk about um, rezoning and the um, North Bonaire area. The last time I was here, I told you about our house that was um, flooded multiple times and bought by the city. So today I wanted to tell you about the um, mental 
an emotional trauma that that caused to our children. Uh, so the first flood that my kids remember, there was uh, one and a half foot of water in our house. Um, they were between five and six years old. And as the flooding was happening, Emerson was following me around, stopping me, sobbing, and asking me if we were going to die. I would soft explain to her, no, we're not going to die. This is just really inconvenient. It's not, it's going to be awful, but not that awful. Uh, I don't think she believed me because every 10 minutes she would ask me again and on repeat. Um, I was running around picking up things, trying to get them off the floor. My other daughter, Avery, was running around with blankets and towels and trying to stop the house from flooding, which no seven-year-old should have to try to do. Uh, then after the flood, we experienced lots of behavioral issues. We had multiple times where um, Avery would not want to go to school. She would be in a complete meltdown state. Uh, Emerson would worry herself where she could not sleep. She would worry herself sick, thinking that the world was going to end because they had just also learned about uh, climate change. And they connected the dots and lots of rain equal climate change equals the world ending. Um, so we did lots of therapy. They're still in therapy because as you may realize, childhood trauma does not go away just because the you've moved out of the house that flooded on you every two years. Um, so we would really like to not open up another <laughs> trauma uh, by punishing them for moving from a house that was flooding every two years. Uh, we would like to stay in Plant District. We. Um, are just asking you to please not consider North Bonaire and West Shore Palms in the rezoning um, so that we can stay there when, if we had stayed where we were, where we did kind of keep the waters out and would have stayed, uh, doesn't get any effect. Um, one, two, or three. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. I don't want to make this mistake again because that would be double. <sighs> Hi, I'm Liam Smith, a straight A principal's honorable national elementary natural El elementary school honor society member at the number one elementary school in the district, Grady Elementary. I am here again, again, begging you to not move me away from my school, my friendships, my AP classes, my after-school activities, my sports teams, and jeopardizing my happiness and mental health. Mental health is one of the most important things for all students, obviously. My mental health was already challenged when I had to spend 22 months at home during the COVID epidemic. I couldn't even go outside. Very sad. Dur dur sorry. During the COVID epidemic, being separated from my friends, it was a traumatizing experience for me. It caused me to be depressed, and I don't want that to happen to any other students. And I don't want them to experience what I went through. If, I, if they're moved to a new school district, leaving their friends, and, friends communities, and families, that might happen. I believe I owe my ad academic success to my teachers, staff, and my favorite principal and vice principal, Mr. Wait, can I find him? Oh, I can't find him. Mr. Campbell and Miss Gonzalez from Grady Elementary School and, and the community. And, sorry. As I have stated before, I have invested my entire childhood into my school system and the people in it and it would be disastrous to take that away from, take that from me and other students from North Bonaire and West Shore Palms not to mention that the two new schools that I'm proposed to go uh, go to are on the other side of two natural boundaries the Tampa International National Airport and the Interstate 275 thank you for t thank thank you for taking the time to review the proposed boundary changes this is all happening so fast but i want i it's super important for you to consider this and all the people in it everyone loves it everyone loves our schools everyone loves being in our district and plant and old coleman and have set their lives up so that their kids can experience that 
And I don't want that to be taken away from their kids, from what they what their decision was to help help their kids have better sanity and better mental health. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me talk. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Brad Smith. It's good to see you guys again today. Um, at, as you just heard from my son, um, he's you know straight A student, principal's honor roll, national elementary honor society, etc. Um, I've been actively working with the PTA for the last six years. I've been a board, I was a board member for like four years. I passed that torch on this year. I do the website. I'm on campus every single day, so I've invested a lot of my life as well and my time, all my free time, in uh, helping out the school. And I would like to say just a few things that I believe that these proposed boundary changes will have a negative consequence on a lot of the students' mental health. And I think as of these days, mental health with students is an extremely important issue. Teen suicide is like at an all-time high rate. I've had to go through depression with my own son. From uh, He has a blood disorder, being separated from all his friends, not being able to have any face-to-face -face interactions for 22 months. It was insane. I mean, and I can't imagine him going through it. Uh, a few other quick things I'd like to say was, as far as being moved around as a child, I can attest to this. My mom was an army brat, as they call them. Uh, we moved every two years she had to move for either economic reasons or the fact that she couldn't sit still. She still does that to this day. But I had to change schools every two years. I went to six different school systems to get through high school. It did not, in the end, affect me academically. I did wonderful. I got a scholarship, went to uh, academic scholarship to USF, graduated three honor societies, magnum cum laude, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it has taken me decades to get over to the mental trauma of moving over and over and over and over and um, just to become a productive member of society today as an adult. I mean, it's taken me decades to get to where I am now. Um, also, my wife lived in the house that we live in and she went to Grady and then Coleman and then the boundaries were changed and she went to Jefferson High School and it has had long lasting effects on her to this day that she still deal deals with. She was even a cheerleader there and it's a wonderful high school and it's nothing wrong with the high school whatsoever but be having to leave her families, the, her friends and their families and everything that she had built up as a community um, from kindergarten all the way up until high school, that was the traumatizing part. You know, it wasn't the school. It was leaving all the things that she had built up, all the families, the relationships. She still has relationships with students that she's known from Coleman and from Grady and none from Jefferson. Uh, and lastly, I would like to say that um, the area that we live in, North Bonaire and West Shore Palms, is the most diverse part of the Plant High School District, both economically and and um, and ethnically. We are the most diverse part of it. And by moving us out of that district, thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Superintendent Addison Davis and school board members. Um, I would like to have a moment of silence for the staff that will not receive their promised pay and step increases due to the lack of fiduciary duty. Thank you. Six months ago, I stood right here highlighting an 11 page document of unsafe working conditions for our students and our staff. I just have a question. Do you want to work with rats? Do you want to work in hot rooms? Do you want to work in unsafe environments? I'm sure the answer to that question is no, but this is the reality of many of our classrooms. And so I want to know who do we hold accountable? Our educators are burnt out by unrealistic expectations and the constant gaslighting that they are receiving. HB1, the universal voucher bill, is going to have a major impact to this district, for sure. This district already submits reports to the state due to the financial obstacles that we're facing. And will you report to Tallahassee how HB1 will impact this district? How will you pay our educators? 
We have educators living in cars. Some are donating plasma just to make ends meet. We have educators that have multiple jobs just to survive. Our educators deserve better. Our support staff deserve better. And our children deserve better. As an educator in this district, it pains me to see our educators so frustrated by the lack of accountability, the lack of transparency, and the lack of intentional focus when making decisions. And I know that some of you are new to the board and so welcome. And some of you were not in place when some of the obstacles happened with the finances. However, we have to do something. And so I'm asking each one of you to use your power and influence to help what's happening in Tallahassee. They are going to fast track these bills and they're going to pass and they're going to have some major impacts to this district. You're already seeing it. So I hope that you take this warning to, to advisement that they're fast tracking these bills and it's going to harm this district and it's going to harm our children. So I need each of you to do what you were called to do and stand up for our students, stand up for our educators, and stand up for our community. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. And the next five speakers, if they'll please line up. Next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is Tasha McCray Comer, and I was withdrawn today by the administrators of Urban Tech college carpentry program for safety. I started April 18th, 2022. I am a dis disabled, disabled student that WorkSource was helping me get back into the workforce. I found a trade that I liked and that stopped me from going to therapy that I've been out of for two years that I started in 2010. For the last two years, I've been doing pretty good. So I decided to go back to school because the first time I tried it, it didn't work. So I tried it again. I, I had four meetings with the administrators about the structure. I just received a syllabus two days ago. I started April 18th. The syllabus came because I complained and complained and complained. Can you tell me what are we doing? Every day is something different. I, I start, I leave one day, I'm laying floors, I come in the next day, we're building cabinets. We never looked at the books. I found out that the curriculum is outdated. It's phased out. Urban Online no longer exists. I filed a grievance. They pushed my grievance out to January 31st. And my meetings just says my grievance is no curriculum, no structure. And for me, a hostile environment, bullying, discrimination against my disability, and discrimination of my gender. We were issued, I, I'm not going to speak for anyone else, I was issued books and online resources that have been phased out, such as the Irwin Online. And the instructor has violated the code of the ethics and the code of conduct, code of conduct by expressing everything that I've said to the administrators, to the students, which gave me a hostile environment. I can't even talk about it without crying. I complained about the integrity of the proctor process and the certification provided. With, within one week, I've been withdrawn. I took a forklift test, drove the forklift. I was given my forklift card. I don't even know who this guy is. And then I was given a paper the next day, fill your name in by someone. I don't even know who he, I, I mean, he's the guy who gave it to us, but I don't even know who this guy is. We took a test, a lift test yesterday. The test broke after four people. Every, all 23 people got certified. They need to do something about this. If the curriculum is not there, it's not there. Let's give me a program where I can, so I've lost eight months of my life. And I don't know what I'm gonna do now. Eight months. Thank you, and, and Dr. Whelan from HR will be speaking with you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, dear board members and the superintendent. My name is Emma Rogier. I'm from North Bonaire neighborhood, 
and uh, I'm talking about the boundary analysis today. Our family moved to this neighborhood six years ago to get in a school of our choices, Grady Elementary, Coleman Middle, and Plant High. Like all our neighbors, we have invested 100% in our kids' education with everything we have. And right now, my 16-year-old is a sophomore at Plant High. He has worked so hard to get into a top engineering college. He has a GPA of 3.92 and is an active member in Plant Beta Honor Club. He volunteers in tutoring to serve the community. And also, he is an athlete in Plant Rowing Crew, spend two and a half hours every day in, in the boat rowing in practice, and also participate in various regatta over the weekends, besides doing his homework. So he's doing wonderful. And my 13-year-old son is a seventh grader at Coleman. He rides his bike to school um, almost every day, which is one mile down the street. However, all these achievements and the daily routine will be taken and will be robbed away from us if scenario two and three ever take place. So some things in life just cannot be measured by saving some money, like our family, like the community, like tradition and the legacy. You cannot just sacrifice those things by saving a few million dollars in paper. In reality, you are losing our trust, and this school district will suffer more down the road. Um, for example, you're going to lose the diversity and the culture at the plant if you take our entire neighborhood from plant feed. And also, you're, not, not, you're looking at a negative impact on transportation. Uh, if you force a switch from Coleman to Pierce, Pierce is seven miles down the highway, and Coleman is one mile down uh, from our house, which makes no sense at all. This implies that the WYZ Studio algorithm is not working. I may get into that uh, when I have time next session. Um, but uh, right now, I just want to say, like all our neighbors, we have to say no to scenario two and three, and I plead every one of you to consider that. Um, because truly, uh, two and three will tear up our community and leave a destructive impact. There are other better um, constructive solutions out there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, I'm Krista Mills. Um, thank you for having us again. We appreciate you guys and all that y'all do. Um, I'm going to get right to the point because I have some catching up um, for you on how Carolwood is doing. You remember one of our dad's club members, John, who came and spoke on our behalf in December. He spoke about how 98% of the kids who finish fifth grade at Carrollwood end up anywhere but our zone to middle school and how our school system is losing really, really great kids that are not returning. He advocated for wanting to see increased graduation rates from the county and how transitioning Carrollwood to K-8 is a solution to a huge problem in our neighborhood. He referred to his fourth grade daughter and his son who will be in kindergarten next year. As much as John and his wife have pushed for this initiative, a few weeks ago they were offered a spot at a K-8 charter school and they took it for both of their kids. A second person you'll remember is Eileen from September meeting. She's involved in our owl pantry, providing food for the underprivileged families. She campaigned for the unmatched community at Carrollwood, how we raised $10,000 worth of food in a single food drive, and how we are proud of our socioeconomic and demographic diversity. She's passionate about our school and about supporting our economically disadvantaged students. Unfortunately, she was also offered a spot at the same charter school. She said it was an extremely challenging decision and it caused a lot of sleepless nights and tears. If the Carrollwood K-8 initiative had already passed, her kids would still be at Carrollwood. Um, with this family, we lost two more children, as well as someone who served our owl pantry so well. Family number three, Isabel and Matt are more avid K-8 supporters. Last week, they were offered a spot at the same K-8 charter school as the previous two families, and they went. The text message that I received from this very close friend is summarized as, it's been very stressful. I really hope that Carolwood transitions to K-8, but we can't bet 50 grand on it, because that's private school money. She goes on to say how amazing and dedicated our community is, and she's lucky to have done school with us for years. She's struggling with the decision because Carolwood feels like family. She's heartbroken and she's afraid. 
the icing on the cake was hearing that her fourth grade daughter wasn't even that upset about leaving Carrollwood because all of her friends have already left to secure middle school spots. We have an entire community screaming about how much we love our school and because it feels like family, but we're bleeding out families left and right because of our uncertainty in middle school. So please hear our plea and add Carrollwood K-8 to your agenda and vote yes soon so that we can retain these kids. Thanks again for what y'all do. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And if, the, and if the next five speakers would line up, thank you. Hello, my name is Jenna Malassi. Thank you again for having us today. As you just heard from Krista, we are losing families that are amazing weekly. We are in crisis mode. We understand that we are a very small fish in a very big boundary pond, but we ask that you please take into consideration adding our initiative as a separate agenda item right away. Please give our wonderful principal time to plan and set this transition up for success. Please do not fail our current fifth graders who are staying at Carrollwood praying that they will have a place to belong next year. Board members, we have met with most of you separately and are so thankful for your time. You are here for our students and we absolutely know that your yes vote will always be remembered in the Carrollwood community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, I'm Patricia Hall. And um, first thing I'd like to say is we really need your leadership on this issue of HB1 and boundaries. As proposed by the Florida legislature, HB1 on school choice will cost taxpayers four billion dollars the first year with escalating costs thereafter. Vouchers provide an illusion of choice, but seven out of ten are unaccredited schools. In Hillsborough County, of 120 private schools, 74 are unaccredited. In Billy Townsend's recent article, 61 percent of voucher kids come back to district schools within two years having lost one year of learning. Related to school boundaries, please repurpose some inner city schools like Just to give middle school seats to children who have been bussed out of their communities for 30 years to McLean and Madison. Look at the school map. Stewart, Young, Orange Grove, Farrell, and Franklin are magnets with few neighborhood children. Madison as a ninth grade center for Plant High School overflow is a viable alternative. Plant and all other high schools built before 1990 were designed for only 10 through 12th grade. Monroe is under-enrolled because Mrs. Elia sent 6th to 8th grade to tinker on MacDill Air Force Base in 2015 to keep Charter Schools USA from going there. Monroe is a much better alternative for overpopulation of Coleman than Pierce. Did WXY drive from Coleman to Pierce? Ridiculous. Students north of Azeal or Cleveland are much closer to the international magnet Jefferson High School with excellent workforce and college-bound class offerings. I ran into somebody yesterday that works at Sergeant Smith. She told me the reason their enrollment is low is because they're surrounded by the failed charter school avant-garde that then became Victory, Slam, and Plato just moved closer to Sergeant Smith. So I hope you will take into consideration all the community comments, the parent comments, and make great decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, everyone. Most of the individuals speaking here today are here with a collective voice. We are Hillsborough County parents and taxpayers united through the district, working closely with established groups such as Hillsborough Education Justice Alliance, Hillsborough Classroom Teachers Association, Jobs for Justice, 
and Hillsborough Public School advocates, just to name a few. We all collectively agree that the proposed boundary changes are part of a bigger picture, the systematic dismantling and privatization of our public schools. We all collectively agree that this entire process surrounding the boundary changes here in Hillsborough County has been unfairly rushed and many voices have been ignored in the process. We all collectively agree that WXY's process of developing the three scenarios is entirely flawed, as are the three options that they proposed. Did you know that one of the proposed scenarios would place two rival gangs at the same school? Adams Middle School. Gangs that are only peaceful during school hours. There's only peace in those neighborhoods when these children are at school, and now we're gonna put them together in one school? That's unheard of. And we all collectively agree that you, the board, cannot possibly make a vote in February with the information and options that you have in front of you now. I attended the forum at Plant High School where many individuals were provided, when, where many individuals provided some great suggestions, out of the box thinking from what WXY had proposed. And the reactions of the XY rep at those alternatives was, they were dumbfounded. They had not even contemplated some of these ideas because they don't know our district. They don't know our schools. They don't know our neighborhoods. Pat Hall made a good suggestion. Did they drive by to see where these schools are and where these boundaries have, are proposed to be drawn? And I ask, why not? How much did we pay them? Half a million dollars to hire this company to conduct a thorough evaluation and provide us with options that we can't use that are not acceptable to anybody? And they only came up with three scenarios which really boil down to one. All of their options leave many questions unanswered and none of, and none of, the, question, of the options answer any of the implications that would happen with the schools that are closed, that would be closed, excuse me. None of their options provide any consistent data. None of them provide a true understanding of the impacts of the proposed scenarios. Many of us were able to attend the forums if we were able to leave work early or have babysitters at home. But what about the underserved of our community? Those who had to head to their second job or third job and couldn't attend the forums, or those that weren't even advised or don't even know that these boundary changes are imminent and happening. We all collectively agree that the deadline needs to be extended in order to formulate a new hybrid model. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Alex Landy. Uh, I have a daughter in kindergarten in Hillsborough County. She goes to Schwarzkopf Elementary School, and I'm here to talk about Schwarzkopf. Um, so Schwarzkopf has been an A school for years, year after year is an A school, and it does this even though it has a large minority population, it's 54% minority, and it's 39% economically disadvantaged. This is a really incredible statistic. It's the third best school in our district, and it's uh, got such a high percentage minority and uh, low economic diversity. Um, this is a large credit to Principal Holly and the teachers and the faculty there. Um, and it, it really is a demonstration for what schools can look like. It's a diverse school, economically, racially, the students do well, everyone does well. Um, but the problem is the three proposed scenarios have the boundary shifting and moving students away from Schwarzkopf to Claywell. And Claywell is a fine school, but the three proposed scenarios have a specific diversity going towards Claywell away from Schwarzkopf. So the three, the three scenarios are increasing economic diversity and racial segregation between schools by creating a more affluent and more homogenous population of Schwarzkopf while shifting economically disadvantaged students to Claywell, which already reports 59% of its students as being economically disadvantaged. And this is problematic. This is a, a opposite to what we're trying to do here. The proposed boundary changes would move 175 students from Lakeview Road, which is a road off of Northdale Mabry, and it has both homes, but it also has townhomes, duplexes, and government subsidized housing. All of those homes are gonna be moved to Claywell, shifting a lot of the diversity that Schwarzkopf has and, and really does well with to another school. And this is um, really gonna shift the kind of the, what Schwarzkopf looks like in the future and change Claywell, making Schwarzkopf more affluent, more homogenized, and making um, Claywell disadvantaged, more disadvantaged than it was previously. So what I ask you to do is to consider these, these data that you have on your, on your websites and the information you've provided us. Consider this going forward and stand with me for equality in education and keeping these students at their current school zones 
Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, thank you for having us here tonight. My name is Danielle Maroney and I live in the Lake Heather Oaks community that is currently zoned for Schwarzkopf Elementary School, Martinez Middle School, and Gaither High School. My son, Aiden Maroney, is a student in Miss Lowry's first grade class at Schwarzkopf. Lake Heather Oaks has been attending these schools for generations and we take pride in our multi-generational Schwarzkopf Bears and Martinez Mustangs. We take pride in the community we've created with these schools and we purchase homes in our neighborhood with the excitement of attending these schools. Lake Heather Oaks is currently being rezoned to Claywell Elementary School and the proposed changes would take Claywell to 107% capacity while leaving Schwarzkopf Elementary School at only 89%. Schwarzkopf, which is the number three elementary school in Hillsborough County, would be underutilized by 70 students. Please take this into consideration as you prepare to vote for any, any scenario changes involving the Lake Heather Oaks community. Please keep Lake Heather Oaks at Schwarzkopf Elementary School and Martinez Middle School. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mark Lutho Largo. You know, there's a big problem. All the schools are sick. All sick buildings. Doesn't matter where you go. On another subject, in the owl tree, collateral victims. Are you putting out that poison to kill the rats? War on rats claims the lives of birds. Doggone shame. And, uh, you probably think that uh, you're saved because the scientists have announced the big breakthrough in fusion energy. So your stupid buildings will get all the energy they need. Not. That's a completely asinine idea template for how the buildings should look. This is the proportion for what the building should look like. The albedo, not any other color. And as Winston Churchill said, in 1960, we shape our buildings thereafter, they shape us. And <clears throat> in the U.S. and they today on January 31st, a study was released. Climate change is worse than we thought. The world faces a significant risk of passing a crucial Global warming threshold earlier than scientists had suggested, possibly as soon as 2050, a paper published Monday found. The threshold is a point at which the Earth's overall temperature has increased by 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And oh, it's going to be bad. And all these children that these people think they care about, the world is going to be a hell. And you keep ignoring science that would make it livable. What a legacy. It's so sad. Just so sad. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. I'm once again here to talk to you about the pornographic books that you have been determined to keep on library shelves and claim to have no ability to do anything about. 
You have even refused to discuss these books by holding a workshop about them until it seems the pressure became too much. Um, this battle that we're engaged in is a battle for the very souls of children, an entire generation being sexualized, yes, through their phones, that's the parent's responsibility, and also through your chosen library books, and that's your responsibility. And again, I will say parents will stop at nothing to protect their children from being sexualized and groomed. For example, did you know that Hillsborough contains seven copies of Gender Queer? Yes, the book that has made national news time and time again. It has drawings of oral sex in it. Without moral grounding and with no anchor point, human nature will sink to the lowest of lows, even sacrificing our children on the altar of woke ideology. For heaven's sake, you've shown all our seventh graders an amaze video in sex ed that tells them they can consent to sex with an adult. And you've heard me talk about this multiple times. I truly hope that your eyes are being open to the battle between good and evil that is happening right in front of you. You've been hiding behind your policies and procedures for book challenges, doing nothing to protect the children that you are supposed to serve, leaving books with sex hookup apps on library shelves. Talk about a slippery slope. This slippery slope is leading children on a path to serious risk and harm. We know that pedophiles prey through these apps and leading them into the depths of despair and confusion, high risk behavior, and potentially even worse. Additionally, you know far too much to claim innocence or ignorance. For 20 months, I've spoken here and sent emails to all of you. I've told you about the horrendous, violent, sexually explicit, drug glorifying, self-harm books that you have continued to protect that you've kept on your library shelves. And you know that it isn't one or two or three books. I've told you I have a list of hundreds of these books that contain explicit pornographic content. And for reasons I just can't possibly understand, you've turned a deaf ear to me. I've made myself accessible to you. Five of you have not reached out to me at all despite making myself available. You've completely ignored countless emails I've sent and all I wanna do is help. And just when we thought we've reached the depths of terrible content, we have just made a new completely despicable discovery in your schools that we haven't yet even touched. I plead with you to listen to your conscience because the welfare of children is on the line. And each day that passes with these books on the shelves, you bear the responsibility of harming the children you should be protecting. You continue to suggest that these books are appropriate for children. And yet, as you well know, this pornographic content cannot be published, broadcast on TV, or distributed, yet you put it in front of children. We will continue to fight. Thank you. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Jessica Dubois. I'm the CEO of HPSA. It's really hard to keep up with all the education headlines nowadays between boundary changes, menstrual cycle reports, what classic book is now banned from libraries. And as I weed through, I wonder, what is it they don't want me to focus on? What's actually happening in our education system? Over the past 25 years, education has slowly been drained of funding. I'm here to tell you defunding, which is the root of many problems and what HPSA advocates for, is sadly, the attack is on all fronts. Just three short years ago, the super voucher was passed, making access to scholarships for special needs students unprioritized. If that's not outrage enough, House Bill 1 is now being reviewed, which will take $4 billion of public funding. That's tax dollars everyone contributes to and make it available to any parent to send their kids to a voucher authorized school or even homeschool their kids. No standards, no oversight, just a major shift of funds with authorizers that can't possibly keep up. Here in Hillsborough County, we're going through boundary changes that don't take into account the middle school desert in the inner city, and the fact that some of our neighborhoods have been bused 45 minutes an hour away for decades. And now, here in our district, quarterly cumulative testing, one of the ones that counts for a grade, is computerized. Do you think a first or a second grader can show their work when they're asked to transfer a problem to a scratch sheet of paper? Here's just another way to exacerbate the digital divide for our minority students that likely can't access or practice on a computer. We saw this problem in COVID. Let's not exacerbate it again. Some of these problems are caused at a state level, and some this board controls and owns. 
We ask this board do not take a vote on boundaries without current and future busing patterns and community voices taken into account. That's the schools that are asked to be repurposed. We should have sessions in those schools. WXY studies were incomplete and didn't take a look at a lot of existing conditions. And board members, let's please not accommodate or teach to a test, especially for six-year-olds who are now forced to spend too much time on devices anyways. And parents, I'm asking you the next time you see a really flaming headline about education, ask what you don't know. Dig a little deeper, ask hard questions, write to your elected officials, and please get involved. The sake of our public education system depends on it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, board members, superintendent, family and friends. My name is Tina Williams Brewster. I'm back again on behalf of mental illness and our students with disabilities. To kind of piggyback off the last speaker said, I implore today, board members, thank you for the ones who have reached out. I feel sorry for the ones who said they were going to reach out and they didn't. Shame on you. Shame on you. I like to take a moment to think about, so we've passed COVID. Now what? Just as, as other speakers have said, mental illness doesn't take a break. It continues. And where's the accountability? We have so many leaders and teachers. They have mental health issues not being addressed. No longer is it acceptable to say what you're not good at. Take a step back. It's just like AA. The first step is admitting you have a problem. Let's admit those problems. Let's have valid conversations. And let's talk to the parents of these students. How about we talk to the students? And no, I'm not talking about these same old surveys that don't really ask the important questions, just the questions that are deemed safe. Ask the students, how does this teacher make you feel? Or better yet, are you learning anything? The papers have told us, do you know that Hillsborough County after fourth grade, our students progressively, continually are two years behind. After fourth grade, our students aren't learning anything. Continuously. COVID didn't reinvent these problems. It just pulled the rug back of what you all have chosen to ignore. My plea, parents, turn off those cell phones. You owe it to your kids to get involved. And leaders, teachers, if you have a problem, kid, reach out to those parents. Document. Don't just ignore problems and say that. The, and then we, we, re we really need to come into the 21st century. Diversity is here. It's not going to go away. A lot of you all talk about the lack of diversity and diversity. This All students need diversity. It's how you learn. I don't have everything together. This group doesn't have everything together. That's how we learn. We all globally get together. Let's be mindful as we make these decisions. No one's thinking about the students. It's all this posturing. I don't want to look bad. It's time to put students first. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Alan Brewster, good evening. I would like to say this. I said this once before, I'm going to say it again. My grandmother always told me, you can't soar like no eagle hanging around turkey. Now, my daughter was yelled at by a teacher at Gaither High School. Elevated her anxiety. She went into a mild depression. The principal ignored it. He didn't do anything. But what he did do, he cited me with disability policy because I said a cuss word after I was told I'm taking my daughter to the school to talk to the social worker or the psychology, this a business. And your daughter didn't come to school, so she need to make an appointment. We said, no problem. We'll wait till they get, they're available. 
but they turned us away. He didn't address that. He gave me a civility email citing that. The second one was to my wife because the teacher we had met with, she had a meltdown in the classroom, started yelling in the classroom. My daughter called my wife and said, this teacher is having a meltdown. Come get me. My wife called the school and told the assistant principal to go get my child out that classroom. She went to the school. They wouldn't let her in. They refused to let my wife in that building. And my wife told them, if something happened to my child, y'all better lower her up. The next day, guess what? The principal didn't address it. He sent the civility email telling my wife, this your second offense. And the next one, I'm going to have Hillsborough County Sheriff escort you off campus. That's the standard of a leader at a school attacking the parents when the school calls the issue. Uh, the principal attacking the parents with the civility policy. What kind of leader is that? How long is it going to take to make a change? No student is going to look up to him as a leader. My daughter doesn't. We don't. But that's supposed to be a partnership there with the student and the parents to resolve any issues that affect the student. That affects my daughter. That affects my wife. And that affects me. I'm going to keep coming here until they make a change at Gate to High School. That's ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Whalen, I'm sure we'll be speaking with you. Will you speak with them? Next speaker? Okay. No. We have someone going back there. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon. Hello? Good afternoon. Um, you all know me. Good afternoon, school board member Washington, Perez, Addison. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Educational Equalizers, LLC. I'm a former Hillsborough County Public Schools educator. I served this district from 2009 up until 2021. I'm here about the boundary changes. We sat here at the workshop and we saw Mr. Washington move to tears. I'm his citizen advisory council rep and I am here on behalf of District 5. My concerns are that our needs are not being met. Our children will be greatly impacted some of the proposed changes would put our kids in direct lines of fire in regards to gang violence from those students being moved from Armwood to Middleton. Those neighborhoods are in conflicts all the time. Our kids' mental health is at stake. We have grandparents who are raising children who do not have the vehicles to transport students from Armwood High School to Middleton. In District 5, we are already at a huge deficit in resources. I worked at James Elementary from 2009 up until 2017. I worked at Woodson from 2018 up until 2020. I worked at Oak Park from 2020 to 2021. I have been mentored by many people in this district. Ms. McCray, good to see you. I worked with her sister at James. I have many relationships in this district. I went to Williams Middle School. I'm a proud graduate of Armwood High School. My son is a first grader, principal honor roll student at Lopez Elementary. He is looking forward to being a hawk. I'm just, I'm letting you know, not a tiger, a hawk. He wants to go to Burnett Middle School or a magnet school of his choice, and he wants to attend Armwood Collegiate Academy. I intend to do everything in my power to make sure that happens. Addison Davis, scenario four is not going to work either. On behalf of the NAACP, we want you to pause. I'm going to say that again. We want you to pause until you seriously get some community members from East Tampa at the table. As a former teacher, I experienced a deep depression under the leadership of Ryan Moody at Oak Park. This caused me to walk away from my title as a media specialist. I was supposed to return October 2022, 
I had a serious conversation with God and he said, no, I have more for you. So I'm looking forward to partnering with you. I'm looking forward to us having a great collaborative relationship, but I'm not going anywhere. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, uh, afternoon, what time it is here. Um, first thing, uh, my name is Chris Blackburn. I am 100% uh, uh, of the North Bonaire, West Shore Palms uh, area uh, family team. Um, I want to thank um, Representative Gray uh, Perez, uh, Dr. Hahn. I thank you guys for coming to the meetings, uh, being part of our community. Uh, it, it means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to our parents, uh, and I'm very sure you saw all the, the kids that were there with us. Um, and, and Mr. Davis, thank you. I know I've, I've seen you enough times now and talked to you at some of the other areas that I've gone to, not just our area, but I, I'm very concerned about everybody's area um, and our children in, our, in Hillsborough County in, in, in general. Um, different angles I was thinking about today when I came here uh, have changed. I am very proud, and I wish they were still here. My son Caleb uh, goes to Grady Elementary. He's just spent six years there. I guess he's in fifth grade now, six years there now. A um, little bit sh more shy than Liam. Uh, they are uh, great friends. They all live a couple blocks from each other. And um, I, I would have uh, made sure I said thank you. Uh, not only to um, a previous uh, Ms. Dalsall, or our, our principal, but now Mr. Campbell and Ms. Gonzalez. They do a great job. Uh, Mr. Smith uh, as well, uh, PTA, but that's part of what I do. I support the school my child's in, and I support my child's education uh, moving forward, and um, I expect him to be uh, at the school that we have been in, in the neighborhood. That'd be Coleman, next up, uh, a plant uh, afterwards. Um, these schools provide my son, I believe, with the best educational needs to get him to college, and whatever his direction he wants to do when he gets to that point. Um, but I, I really did, that meant a lot to me, the, what, the recognition they got today. Um, our kids are very important. Um, Liam, two blocks this way, we're all in the same boat. Two blocks the other way, we're splitting them all up. I, I, I'm not gonna state my age, but I'm old enough to know that I've got kids that are friends from sixth grade still. And it's very important that we keep our kids together. They want to be together. And the traumatic, and I did some research and all, but the, the, the issues, and mental health, whatever we want to say it is nowadays, um, of, of splitting kids up. Whenever possible, keep your child at a same school or a school in the same district. Research has found moving schools can be particularly difficult for children in elementary and middle schools. Again, I thank you guys uh, for being uh, with us, and let's um, make those right decisions. Thank you thank again. You. Thank you very time. much. Next speaker, please. And if the next few speakers will please line up. Hello, everyone. Ryan Hazinski, former employer or employee, I guess, of Hillsborough County Schools, uh, officially resigned a little over six months ago. And so I wanted to come and put a capstone speech, if you will, on my school board time. I'm sure you guys are probably sick of looking at my face anyhow. So let's first address the peak absurdity that I see in the headlines every single day. Um, where to even begin? People worried about books. Let me tell you something. No one reads. 25% of the American public basically keeps publishing alive. No one reads now. People are worried about books and their kids have TikTok. Come on now, wake up. We are looking at all the wrong targets, all the time. We have an education system that is completely outmoded. It was designed in the late 19th century and meant for 20th century employment. We are almost a quarter of the way into the 21st century. Everything should be torn down and re-envisioned. No one, we'll just keep focusing on the same thing. It is a grave mistake we are making. We have the most politically connected people administering an education system that is not even public. Let's be real, HB1, I don't even know what's about. I mean, I just saw like people talking about it and it's probably more voucher crap and I'll be the first to say, 
we have an education commissioner who gets, I'm assuming, still a six-figure salary from Doral College. I'm talking about Senator or former Senator Manny Diaz, who did nothing during his time in the House and the Senate to publicly break all this up and to privatize education. It's all crony, corp crony capitalism, corporate welfare, whatever you want to call it. I mean, this is, this is where we're at. This is where Florida's at. I worked as a recruiter for about 15 months when I left the classroom. You know how much starting people in brand new roles, out of college, fresh degree, making 60 grand. You gotta grind 17 years in this district to get to 60 grand. Wake up. Wake up. Everybody, wake up. This profession is being destroyed. I don't think it's going to last another 20, 25 years. Kids can go online, have chat GPT, write their damn essay. Wake up. So I got 30 seconds left. I want to offer some final words of encouragement to my fellow educators who are left behind. Victor Frankl tells us that when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. I deeply miss the classroom, but I could no longer be a teacher. So if you are a teacher in this state or an educator of any stripe, especially in years 10 through 20 or 25, quit. That's the best advice I can give you. Quit. No one cares. Your family cares about you. Your students might care, but no one cares. Quit. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Jerry Boyle. I live in the North Bonaire area of South Tampa. And first, I wanted to thank uh, members of the school board for the community outreach. Dr. Han, you came, talked to our neighborhood. I was overseas, deployed overseas. Ms. Perez, I saw you at Morgan Woods. Uh, Ms. Combs, I talked to you individually at Sickles High School. Um, Ms. Gray, uh, she came uh, to a community engagement. I'm sorry I didn't get to meet the rest of you. And then Addison, uh, Superintendent Davis, thank you. Uh, we had a very good discussion. And so I think you are hearing our feedback. I did want to talk today about the consulting firm. Uh, and I'm going to screw up the acronym, um, you know, because it's somewhat confusing sometimes. Uh, but I do believe, and I sent everyone on this board and Addison Davis yesterday a, two PowerPoint slides which kind of show the amateurish nature of the rollout, and I also believe some uh, fundamental um, erroneous data that was used. So the first slide I sent you, and I have extra copies of it, was this slide right here. My neighbor, right across the street from us, is not listed, does not have their house listed on this data. And then I showed you some of the businesses that are around in the West Shore area, and they don't exist. They all went out of business in 2016, 2017. The company claims to use ArcGIS, which is a military program that I've used, uh, and this is not ArcGIS, okay? This is 2016, 2017 map. I don't know if it means that the underlying data is wrong, but it just, once again, goes to show that from a feedback mechanism, it looks amateurish. But what's more important is the second slide I sent you, and I will just go down to Pierce Middle School. In scenario two, I'm sorry, uh, existing utilization is 67%. In scenario two, there are 336 students that are rezoned to Pierce Middle School, and the utilization rate goes up to 81%. In scenario three, no students are rezoned, but the utilization rate goes up to 85%. That makes absolutely no sense. Now, I, I'm just a, a, you know, a simple Marine, but from looking at this, it does not make sense to me. And I'm wondering is if there is erroneous data being used. But the larger issue is the feedback mechanism because the Boundary website was the only feedback mechanism we had to XYZ and to you folks unless people emailed you. But if this is wrong, what they pull out of here when people are looking at it, then the whole system has been wrong in how we approach you as school board members. So I know there's not much you can do, uh, but when you do your webinars or your, your workshops, I would ask to, uh, I would ask that you ask the hard questions about what the underlying data is, because I think it is fundamentally uh, erroneous. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. We have three more speakers. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Nikki Rivera, and I've had the pleasure to meet several of you through my work as a pro-public education uh, community organizer. 
I'm also a resident of Temple Terrace, uh, a recent graduate from USF, a uh, member of the Puerto Rican community and the Latinx community, and I'm representing uh, the Tampa Bay chapter of LULAC here today. I'd like to take my time to also uh, discuss the boundary analysis, specifically uh, community participation in the process. And I'd like to start by thanking everyone um, involved in this process, including the community, for working tirelessly on the project. Like many of us in the room, I attended several of the phase two Galleria presentations and heard a variety of concerns from our community members. Reflecting upon these concerns, what really stood out to me were critiques of the process lacking transparency and equitability. Now, I've never participated in the redistricting of a school district, um, so I did some research on best practices. And what I learned is that Hillsborough County, uh, at least seemingly, has engaged in many best practices related to um, data, related to demographics, enrollment projections, commuter mapping, et cetera. However, the district has lacked a robust uh, community engagement until late in the process. We know that parental and community engagement in school, dis school decision-making processes is vital. And according to my research, uh, particularly in redistricting and rezoning uh, processes. While I recognize that the phase one webinars and the phase two Galleria presentations were strategies of community engagement, our community is clearly asking to take a larger role in this important decision. Uh, community data collection, excuse me, community data collection, focus groups, uh, public workshops, community committees for scenario development are all strategies and opportunities to engage the community that the boundary analysis has missed. At this point, what you can do is listen to the community and respond to its feedback through your actions. I ask that you critically analyze our community's concerns and requests in a systematic way and act both with students' best interest and the community's wishes in mind. As a final note, I'd also like to add that I know many teachers would have also liked the opportunity to participate in this meeting, but were not able to because of the scheduled time and date. Again, I ask that you make a concerted effort to listen and to respond to community feedback through your actions. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, my name is Dallas Evans. I live in the Lake Heather Oaks subdivision, which is currently zoned for Schwarzkopf and Martinez. Since having children, my wife and I have been struggling to find the right educational fit for our family. My son had struggled at a previous school and we moved several times since our children had been born. Schooling's always been our primary selection in choosing a home. Before moving to our neighborhood, our schools had unfortunately not been a great fit for us uh, or our family but we chose our current home specifically because we wanted our children to attend Schwarzkopf and Martinez. My children are currently enrolled at Schwarzkopf. My daughter, she's in third grade, very much looking forward to the Valentine's dance tomorrow evening. My son's in fifth grade. He's on the patrol. He's so proud of this, he wears a safety belt everywhere. We have to ask him to take it off to go to bed. My children have absolutely thrived at Schwarzkopf. Not only that, we found that our neighborhood's a true community, a type you rarely find these days. We've become close with our neighbors from our shared time at the bus stops, from calling and texting each other when it's time for our children to come home, and from making sure each other's children are watching for cars when crossing the road. I've never been part of a, such a wonderful community. The, the glue that holds this together is the children's shared schooling. With the recent discussions regarding school reassignments, many of our neighbors have been considering school choice, magnet schools, you know, other options. It's heartbreaking that this great community might be distanced as the children no longer spend their days together and talk excitedly about upcoming school events. My daughter's been worrying she'll lose friends in class as a relatively small group of students in our neighborhood would be assigned to a new elementary. My son, he's struggled so much elsewhere, has embraced school and is looking forward to attending Martinez next year with all of his friends. There's only a small number of students that are currently zoned for Schwarzkopf and Martinez, which would be affected by the proposed change uh, for the first three options, primarily consisting of our neighborhood. Allowing our children to stay in their current schools would have little impact on the capacity of these schools, um, and you have the opportunity to help us preserve the wonderful community within the neighborhood we call home with neighbors that are our friends. 
I noticed sitting here tonight that the hybrid option four would do just this. Um, I humbly ask you to please consider allowing our neighborhood to remain zoned for the schools that we moved here in order to attend and support option four as proposed for our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Amanda Evans, wife of Dallas. I left him to say all the uh, good things about our community or else I'd break into tears. My, mom, my son, Dylan, is in fifth grade going to Martinez Elementary Old on Lake Heather Oaks is a close-knit neighborhood uh, full of diversity. In our area, we have single-family homes, townhomes, duplexes, Section 8 housing, and apartments, which only add to the diversity of our zone schools, which we would like to maintain. Our community is highly active in our schools. I believe Martinez and uh, Steinbrenner High Schools were both recognized today uh, for their PTSA. Um, our, our children run outside and play together, have best friends, can talk about homework, friends, teachers, and extracurricular activities. The proposed changes may break up that peer group in a pivotal time in their relationship. In all three scenarios, they are moving our children out of their current elementary school due to anticipated growth within our region. And I question where the growth is coming from as there's no new developments in our area and just a couple miles north that we're already in Tabasco County. I understand the need to even out utilization across schools. Uh, as a fellow previous high school teacher at C. Leon King High School, I understand that utilization and best using our budget is important. Um, however, uh, across all the proposed scenarios, there was not much change to the utilization that are affecting our neighborhood. Um, so I'm asking that our, our kids maintain their, their feeder pattern and uh, maintain that targeted utilization rate across all the schools that they're currently in. Uh, Schwarzkopf, Martinez, and Gaither High School. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes our public comment. And we will move on to uh, the proclamation. Um, AO1, Adoption of Proclamation, Career and Technical Education, CTE Month, February 2023. Member Washington will be highlighting this proclamation. Thank you, Madam Chair. The theme for this year's CTE Month is Celebrate Today and On Tomorrow. And that is precisely the vision for the tens of thousands of students in Hillsborough County who are part of our career and technical education courses. There are more than 500 career-themed courses and 100 career and professional education academics in Hillsborough County. We have hundreds of educators who dedicate their careers to helping these students succeed in these high-demand pathways. During CTE Month, CTE educators, district staff, students, and business partners will be involved in various career awareness activities which will highlight the numerous career paths available to students in Hillsborough County. Career and technical education offers students opportunities to earn highly and value industrial certifications to develop a multitude of skills while experiencing rigorous curriculum with real world applications. CTA students who complete a program of study are eligible for many scholarships. Thank you, Madam Chair, for that. Thank you, Member Washington. I need a motion and a second to approve Career and Technical Education CTE Month, February 2023. I have a motion by Member Gray. I have a second by Member Vaughn. Any discussion? Yeah. Member Gray? Just uh, not the discussion as much as I just wanted to um, uh, send my appreciation to Chris Jargo, Scott Brooks, Yvonne Fry. Um, those are just uh, but a few that are giving uh, the Hillsborough County Public School District a additional track uh, from college 
equalizing another path, which is vocational tech education. Um, and their biggest challenge is communicating to the students because they need to know the great programs and the value that uh, they give as they go through each of those programs. Um, that was my only comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Member Gray. Member Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd also like to reiterate Yvonne Fry, Chris Jargo, and Scott Brooks have done an excellent job. Uh, because I often say that everyone is not academically inclined, but there are ways you can be a productive citizen in society, in society by having great career jobs. And I just want to thank them because in the years past, we, we have come up to a portion of our lives now where we want everybody to try to be successful in every way we can because I think it's so important. I think career tech is so important. It's many ways, you know, you could, you could be successful. We got plumbers. I mean, we got electricians, you name it. And they make a lot of money. They make a lot of money. I remember one time somebody told me, I don't know how true this is, they, a doctor, he decided not to do, not to be a doctor. He went to be an electrician. He made $50,000 more being an electrician than he was being a doctor. That's amazing. So I just like to say continue, uh, Yvonne Fry and Chris Drago and Scott Bush, continue working hard so we can prepare our students for life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Vaughn? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate my fellow board comment, uh, my fellow board members' comments, um, but in regards to talking about plumbers and electricians, and as we talk about the people who support our career source, uh, our, our, our CTE programs, one career source needs to be named along with all the other names that we've mentioned, as well as our trade unions. They're a huge partner in when you talk about plumbing and electricians and the building trades and careers that are going to really propel our students to have success and earning opportunities. We cannot not name the trade unions that have partnered and offer, uh, offered apprenticeships. So I just wanted to make sure as we thank people and, and use names, we are awesome also talking about career source as well as our trade unions. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Rendon? I just want to take an opportunity to acknowledge the fact that, you know, as many students look at their future and as they start into high school and they recognize that maybe a secondary post-education is not for them, I'm very thankful for this district, um, Scott Brooks and the CTE community, the Future Career Academy, Career Source, and many other community members, businesses, community leaders that are all working together to give each of our students an opportunity to look at something different than an educational path. We all need these students to choose various paths that are going to meet their needs so they can become productive, active members of our community, supporting one another. So I want to thank our businesses, our community leaders, many of these programs that are supporting it, and our school administrators. Thank you, Member Rendon. Member Perez? Along with the school, with the, with the community leaders, I'm going to echo what um, Board Member uh, Vaughn said. You know, when, with the, with the um, unions, when they get our students into a career path, within four years, those students are already um, certified to move onto the path into um, careers that are paying six figures already. And um, when they go into a college, you know, in four years, they're just starting their careers. So, you know, our unions who are partnering with us in this district um, and helping mold our students into amazing um, leaders here along, you know, he, to stay. They are staying in Hillsborough County, being um, successful and being part of our community. Thank, thank you, Member Press. And I just wanted to echo all, all the comments from the board members and say, you know, at the end of the day, we want 
students to have so many options. I know when I graduated from USF, there was an 81-year-old that graduated with me. So at any age, you know, we want students to be prepared for whatever path that they choose. If it's college, it's as technical, if it's vocational, we want them to choose that, whatever, whatever they see fit. But we need to make sure that students I see often the senior year of students, most students have almost finished all their uh, credits and we want to give them options. And it's not going to always be, you know, Hills, you know, HCC or, or dual enrollment or AP classes. The CTE certifications that we've had in this district are outstanding. Huge increases across the district and Superintendent Davis, thank you. You know, you were recognized as Superintendent Year for the CTE, for all that you do, and Scott Brooks and Chris Jargo for all the hard work. And we just want to remember that we want to give children many options and at the end of the day, before they walk out of the doors, they need to have some type of path, some type of idea of what they're going to do because if not, what they do is they take a year or two off and then they struggle and then they maybe start a program and not finish it and then get in debt. So we want to make sure that students have a pathway, they have an idea, and they have some confidence as they go out into the workforce. So I want to thank this district for everything that they do, um, all the different programs, Union, uh, Future Career Academy, Career Source, all of the community that works so hard and all the companies that have come in today through Hillsborough County and have supported our students. So thank you. Now please vote when your lights appear. And, and it passes unanimously. I need a motion now and a second to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion by Member Washington and I have a second by Member Hahn. Please vote when your lights appear. and it passes unanimously. The following items will now be heard. C-703. 703, approve the highest rank response for request for proposal 22194 MST KG Web and Geographical Information System GIS Services. Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Yes, ma'am, the chair. This is a service we desperately need with our district in order to continue to track development within our school district. This is an opportunity for us to look at the geographical information system, which is a geographical data collection that allows us to be able to work with the county uh, commissioners to identify in, in, uh, of incoming projected incoming homes and also be, uh, students with any participate in anticipated development. In addition, this is also helps us on our school website where we have that school locator where their parent can go into a go into our website put in their address and it really identifies what school that individual will be uh, identified for within their boundary and lastly being able to help with the choice window. If we have school, we have a student that uh, attends a school and their parents want them to look at choice offerings within their geographical location, they can put in their address uh, during the choice window and that once again identifies all open seats within our school district so that that parent can identify what choice initiative or what choice application they will put in in an effort to move forward. Um, this is a $72,000 uh, expenditure and this is being used with land proceeds. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item C-703. I have a motion by Member Gray. I have a second by Member Hahn. Member Rendum, you pulled this item. Do you have any questions or comments? Um, yes, yeah, so thank you. Um, no, sorry. Yeah. Got me up there. Um, thank you, Superintendent, for um, taking some time to meet with me earlier about this. So, you know, one of my concerns and one of my things I wanted to know is where where's the data going to go? What are we going to do with the data and how private are the information? I know that we explained that it's going to look like a Google map concept. However, we all know that Google can pretty much see the you know swing set that's built in my backyard. So exactly what are we doing with all this data that we're collecting? Yes, Madam Chair, this data just stays with our growth management team and anything that it does from a uh, community perspective as it identifies geofences and just like boundary initiatives or communities, it just gives a broad scenario of maps that um, of that community members can identify and locate schools. So it's nothing related to any personal information from student, any personal information for parents. It's just more for mapping uh, purposes like a GPS that we use 
use in order to identify locations and then really help us identify developments for uh, continued builds within the district. One more thing, I just want to clarify that we talked about the new Synergy system that will be coming in to our schools and having all of our data and information. And so that new system does not have a geographical ability to provide this information back to the district for them to predict areas of new students, to predict and show st allow our families to have choices and option when they can plug that in. Am I correct? Hey, that's a great question. So Synergy doesn't have that availability to do geographical locations. So this will be, this one good thing about this type of service will be able to merge it and have geo referencing all the way into Synergy so it'll be seamless to be able to take this information and plug and play with Synergy as we launch it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Board members, please vote when your lights appear. And it passes unanimously. It's about 10 minutes prior to employee input, so Superintendent Davis, if you'll, you'll have your comments, and then we'll do employee input after that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so very much this evening. Uh, we'll provide district update celebrations, identify some consent agenda items that were approved, also give a boundary update, and then highlight some suspended agenda. First and foremost, as we look at strategic plan, all the goals one through four, we'll talk about celebrations within our district. And thank you to Mr. Hearns for coming this evening and, and, and acknowledging Black History Month for 2023. The theme is celebrating history makers of Hillsborough County. A uh, number of hashtags we out there for those who want to share any of your uh, school activities, any of your uh, classroom activities. And also we want to make certain that uh, this entire community understands that we have activities taking place at every one of our schools in Hillsborough County as we have continued to provide ongoing resources for students to continue to be exposed to some of the trailblazers uh, from the Black History Month of 2023. Uh, teachers will also be able to leverage Mayan to be able to identify uh, text to allow them to enrich their knowledge of black history. And we have so many different school-based activities and spotlights going on, uh, identification of leader of the day, and all, a lot of online classroom experiences for us to be able to expand this initiative. Uh, in addition to that, we have power hour spotlights to be able to talk about accomplishments of some of the, uh, some of the great leaders, African-American leaders with the, with throughout this nation, and then also being able to look at uh, a number of read-ins. So if individuals that uh, aspire to go in and push into our classrooms and conduct read-ins, please contact your school. And then we'll continue to make certain that we partner with not only Hillsborough County education contest, but also with the Department of Education contest to be able to recognize students from a local, state, and a national level. And then so many family resources I continue to, to be ex extended to schools to, to help them, especially through our FACE initiative. FACE continues to be that advocate and then also being able to make certain that we have a Black History West Central Avenue or walking tours to be able to help our students and get involved in, in addition to artwork which will continuously be displayed in our uh, Rozak lobby. So please stop by and see some of the great work that our students are competing in and demonstrating their passions along the way. Also, we want to recognize some highlights. You know, we, we have magnet schools that have national recognitions. This is the National Merit Awards results. This is for magnet schools of America, and they, they look at, at every magnet school that applies. They look at, uh, f there's 4,300 magnet schools in the nation that compete for this, and they look at academics, development, segregation efforts, parent and community engagement, and then also what kind of innovative programs and initiatives that we apply within Hillsborough County. And what we the results have come back, and we have 17 National Merit Awards this year, which is a celebration to our district, and we also have the top three in Florida in total awards uh, of earning. We're in the top three. We're going to try to be number one. We'll never stop. And then we're also identified as uh, having uh, the number six in the nation related to the number of schools that we have acknowledged for this really uh, cool initiative with the National Merit Award. The schools that are in front of you today, we have a number of elementary schools, a number of middle schools, a number of, of high school magnets. We thank them for their dedication, their commitment, and not only just offering these magnets in name, but openly implementing and creating the best experience for our children and allowing our children to have innovative spaceways so they can really follow their passions every day within our school district. So congratulations once again. We appreciate uh, Mr. Cox and his efforts and then, uh, and then all of our principals and support staff to, to make this a reality. 
In addition, we want to highlight to the school board for the second consecutive year, Hillsborough County Public School District has led the state in bonus uh, funding for industry certification. We've also uh, led the state with a number of uh, CTE classes, not only students engaged in, but passing the CTE certification. Uh, with uh, we've earned over 1,500 uh, industry certification FTE, bringing 7.2 million dollars to this district. It goes to our schools and to our teachers and to our programs. Uh, once again, we'll continue to, to show a uh, an expansion of this of CTE courses, not only at the high school level, but everything we can do to do it at the middle school level as well. And this is just a little trajectory of what a map of of showing that all the funding that we have have increased. And this is money bringing to our school district, bringing to our schools. And hats off to our our staff with CTE, Scott Brooks, Chris Jargo for leading this way and, and continuing to take on my challenge when I got here for them to be able to expand pathways for children and allow them to have credentials that separates them from others as they compete not only locally but throughout the state and throughout this nation. And then thank you to the board for allowing our students who continue to take some, some really cool initiatives. We have students from Steinbrenner going to the Smoky Mountains, Plant High Schools being able to go to, um, uh, to Indiana to, for their orchestra. And then also we have Gaither being able to compete in ROTC field trips. And then Wharton being able to transition to go to regionals to be able to compete as well. And then also this evening from Goal 4, which is about fiscal responsibility and operations. We just want to remind our community that uh, tonight we just release uh, Scenario 4. And please note to the community why this is my recommendation. We'll have a workshop on Monday, next Monday the 13th. We'll really get some true interaction from the, the school board and, and being able to come to a recommendation through that feedback process that will be sound in, in for our school district and, and impact us in a positive way. We'll have community meetings from the February 20th through 23rd, then also being able to start our first reading on February 28th and March 9th as it sits today. So please take the time to get feedback, go to our website and interact with that plan as we continue to try to make the best decisions for this organization. And then for suspended agenda, career, future career academies continue to, to make strive. One of the things we, the board asks is can to have analytical data and some pre-assessments of students going in where they, before they go to field trip experiences. And we see where, you know, going in students before they went into any field experiences, did they understand that there were some really cool jobs and, and sophisticated jobs in this community? And you see that 54% prior to engaging in FCE to 82% meaning students are being involved in understanding what, what our community has to offer, and then also being able to you know, better understand and have a significant improvement of where they stand related to identifying that there really are some really good companies that they can transition into the workforce that not only pay well but have great benefits and a great culture and allows them to sensationalize and, and, and act upon their current passions and their current skills within our school district. And you see that through uh, these two analytics. In addition, we also see is, you know, if students are, you know, do they really know what kind of job they're involved in or they are, are, are interested in? And after field experiences, we see that percentage tremendously go up by 14, by 13 percent. And that number will continue to grow as we continue to have exposures uh, with other corporations and companies. And we thank FCE for creating that space. And then also being able to, um, you know, understand that there are jobs available within Hillsborough County. And we see that almost doubled with our students being able to have that particular exposure. Uh, the biggest thing we see our kids are taking tours at Ajax to, to look at uh, construction, building design. Um, you, we see that taking place. Uh, you know, also, they're going to sh you know, Stingray Chevrolet, which is a big provider and partner within our community, to recognize it's not only about sales, but there's also business, business management, leadership, um, within this corporation with financing and all of that to be able to expose. And we thank Mr. Hurley and his team for offering that space and then also being able to look at, you know, outside of Pepin's, which is a company of number one priority is, is increasing customer expectation and customer service. So looking at these type of experiences, our students are learning about what the possibilities are and we thank the board for continuing to strengthen this relationship as we move forward uh, with, this with this particular initiative. And then... Also, once again, we have Wish Farms, which is a multi-generational year-round supplier of strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, and uh, just being able to look at foundational company, companies of how to not only to, to start in this company, but how to become an entrepreneur. So these tours and sessions and exposure is just strengthening our students to allow them to be able to be prepared as they transition to the workforce. And lastly, being able to, to connect with uh, Plant City Mayor 
uh, you know, Kilton and being able to identify what options they have in Plant City for students to be able to transition to the workforce. So we appreciate this partnership. We look forward to strengthening it. And um, that's it for this evening. Thank you so much, Superintendent Davis. And it was like perfect timing right at six. So oh, yes, we will now move to employee input. I think we only have one employee here today, but we will now take employee input. Even though we hear public comment at the beginning of the meeting, it is sometimes difficult for employees of our district to attend meetings at four o'clock. There are many ways for employees to make their voices heard, including through union representatives, emails, phone calls, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and public comment at the beginning of the meeting. The board wants to hear from you. With this section of our agenda, we're creating another avenue for employees to speak to the board. We're setting aside 30 minutes for employees of the district to speak to the board about any issues that are on your mind. This is not intended to be a discussion about specific agenda items on tonight's agenda, but rather an opportunity for you to speak to the board about any issues related to your job or the district. Each speaker will have three minutes. Hi, I'm Carissa Denica from uh, Gaither High School. Last time that I was here, um, I spoke about how the more uh, requirements with Canvas and and my student loan load, load and um, and everything really uh, affects uh, affects me and affects my teaching and affects um, you know just in general. Um, but today, I wanted to kind of talk about um, how we um, as teachers right now are really being uh, not gracefully said kind of five minutes to death um, we are given things that oh well it'll only take you five minutes so why are you complaining but it's five minutes here and five minutes there and i'll just remind you that i only have 48 minutes um, of a conference period to, to do any planning I have for all of my classes including grading so um, I have that going on um, uh, one one just simple uh, thing to, to kind of give you an example is um, the idea to take printers out of the classrooms and put them in a centralized location sounds pretty reasonable except for the fact that my my nearest printer is about a two minute walk from me so it's two minutes there make whatever copies or printing that I need to do and then two minutes walk back to my classroom I am that is at least five minutes of time that I won't get back um, because of that, I have to find alternate times, which means I'm staying later after school, and I have to figure out how else to do that, which leads me to time that I'm not spent with my family, and which leads me to mental health issues. Recently, I, um, I told my husband not to let my girls watch this because I uh, recently was suicidal. I didn't have, there was no reason for me to be here. My students hate me, the parents hate me, my family would do better without me. I was worthless, that's how I am. And obviously that's not true, I'm in a much better place, just in case you're wondering. I, I did go past that. It's something that I deal with and there, there's many teachers that deal with this. We deal with depression and anxiety and our look, uh, everything is, reasonably looked at at the the kids and making sure that their social emotional health is 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 right there but we're, we're not looked at the edu the educators not just teachers the other people are there and we're not looked at we are looked at as make sure that the kids are safe but we're not looked at as we need to be safe and uh i i don't know how we fix that, but I will tell you that the private sector has looked at how to help their employees. I don't feel that you have looked at how you help your employees. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming, and I, I know the board very, very hears you. I, we, we hear you, thank you very much. Um, we will move now to our final part of the meeting, which is board comments. Um, Member Washington, you'll begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to say happy Black History Month. This is truly good, excellent. Um, first of all, I started off yesterday morning at James Elementary School, where I had the opportunity to speak to so, to speak to second graders. And my topic, I read uh, Michael Jordan, because everybody know I'm a coach, all the way. So I started with Michael Jordan, and the reason why I started with Michael Jordan because I wanted students to realize you could come, you can become great even though you're cut from a team. Michael Jordan was cut from a basketball team, 
in the 10th grade. He worked hard that summer. His, he went to his parents. His mother said, the only way you're going to get better is by working hard. He worked very hard and came back and was one of the greatest players in the history of the, of the game. He was a great player in high school, a great player in college, and even greater in the NBA. And I just wanted kids to understand, just because you fail doesn't mean it's over. There's always a, there's always a track for you to bounce back. And they were really elated. And plus, you know, I gave them some money for an ice cream party. So they they always just break my heart, them little kids. You know, I, I do that all the time. I mean, wow. But also, tomorrow, I mean, uh, Sally, you know, we have the Black History Brain Bowl, which will be at Milton High School from 9, uh, from 9 to 2, 9 to 3, I'm sorry, 9 to 3. So come out. You'll be surprised and look at the kids when they do a great job. They really are good at that brain bowl. They're really good. Um, also, you know, I, you know who, who really doesn't get a lot of credit, and I, and I have to say this, is, is Allison Edgecombe. Because she's been working with Thurgood Marshall History Clubs for, for a period of time, and she does a great job. But we talk about high school, we never th talk about it. But Allison, I just want to give her a shout out. And also, I want to give Kristen Davis a shout out. Kristen, you know, you're one of the hardest workers. And, and you really do a great job. We, you, I, when we were in Tallahassee, I just enjoyed it. It was great. It was very organized. One of the best I've seen, been around in the last three years. So I, I just wanted to give you kudos. You, you did a great job with that. Um, and, I, and I'm going to close out. I'm not going to be very long here because, um, I want to, the, I want to say something here because it is black history. And one of my favorite, one of my favorite people, a person, is Harriet Tubman. I love Harriet Tubman. Because you know, she's the lady that had the opportunity to drive the, tr the, dri the drive the train to get the train to peep out of slavery. And I always remember these words she said. If you hear the dogs, keep going. She said, if you see the torches in the woods, keep going. She said, if they are shining after you, keep going. Keep going. Never stop, she said. Never stop. Keep going. If you want the taste of freedom, you keep going. Thank you, Madam Chair. And that's it. Thank you, Member Washington. Member Gray? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um Member Washington, and, and indeed we have a lot to be looking forward to with Black History Month. Um, big kudos to Superintendent Davis and to Terry Connor, uh, the curriculum staff, Monica Vera Torado. So many of you put forth such wonderful eclectic programs. I mean, everything from the walking tours to the uh, African American reading sessions. Um, but it really shows the momentum is real from our district to the communities. And it's so important that whatever um, diversity uh, group that we have, diverse group, it, that, that their culture and their sense of, of who they are um, is, is not only learned but also championed. Um, and, and they need the education so much. Thank you, uh, Sheikh, for that uh, athletic uh, analogy, too. So much of it, so many great role models. I also wanted to say, um, the jumping around, uh, we had a uh, Teacher of the Year. I'm going to say a few Teachers of the Year, but the uh, National Alliance of Black School Educators had a teacher of the year. Uh, her name is Nicole Alicia Garden, Golden, Golden, sorry, Nicole. But sometimes we don't recognize um, our black American uh, big success stories, and uh, that came to my desk not long ago. Um, real quick, no, not real quick. All right, the uh, we talk about community schools, and I, I reckon that most of us have visited a school or two. But, you know, what, what comes to mind first when you see a community school? I mean, the kids are happy, they're embraced, but many elementary schools and middle schools and high schools are. But what happens is you've got the Kiwanis Club, you've got the Mosaic, you've got Feeding Tampa Bay, you've got so many YMCA, Boys and Girls Club, all these 
folks are coming in and making sure the children are well taken care of financially, uh, social, emotionally, um, food security, all these elements. And uh, Catherine Gilmore, I know most of us know her, um, but she needs to be really recognized. Um, and I went to Gibsonson <coughs> Community School, uh, which is right down the road. Um, member Rendon, you know, that's not far from where we live right down Boyette. I didn't realize that until I took the shortcut. But uh, Principal Miss Cindy Guy, she's going to be leaving, but she does a wonderful job, as her AP does as well. But, um, you know, we're always reminded to embrace those partners, too. And I didn't write them all down. But also, oh, and the Children's Board. Um, the employees of the year, most likely people uh, on this day will recognize them, but we did want to say to Nic Nicolette Behrens um, from Oak Park, fifth grade uh, teacher, was the teacher of the year, uh, Chinova Shedrick, instructional support of the year from Memorial Middle uh, ESE, um, anyway, uh, you know, I know that uh, the principal there, gosh, it just, just flew off my uh, radar, but she was all excited. Uh, Superintendent, what, what is the principal's name of Moore again? Yeah, don't tell her I forgot her name because I'll, I'll really get in, uh, in trouble. Hi. Uh, anyway, um, and of course, uh, at um, Plant, uh, Mohammed Counter, uh, the J.O. The JROTC instructor received the Ida S. Baker Award, Mohammed Kantor. Um, Member Han, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Did you get that name figured out? Okay. Dante. Uh, what a wonderful role model. Dante. So, but one of the things, too, that, that this board never misses is that we have, those are the stellar recognized teachers, but all the teachers. Uh, deserve to be congratulated and recognized. And I wish we, you know, we, we have a big district. But at any rate, um, that's all for now. And gosh, I used up all my time. All right, thank you. Thank you, Member Gray. Member Rendon? Thank you. Um, so um, Member Gray and I had the privilege of attending the Battle of the Belts. We had 19 high schools participate in uh, the Battle of the Belts and seat buck and buckle up. We want to thank our Hillsborough County Sheriff for partnering with GEICO and our schools for paying close attention to our students and our young drivers' safeties. So um, we're going to go ahead and roll the winning PSA from Bloomingdale High School. I can cook it, I can drive it while I whip it and ride it. I'll follow all the little tips that buckle up and provide it. I will wreck it, I will crash it, but I'll drive it, we'll fly it. And every time I'm in the car, I always match the speed limit. I got a safety R I V E safety R I V E V E V E V E I V E safety R I V E. One thing about me is I always say try. I know that I'm buckle teams are least likely to survive. I always buckle myself up to reduce the risk by 45. I use my blinkers left to right and keep the stop sign in mind. They think it's trendy, they so risky, but it's not worth a try. A seatbelt strapped across my waist, I think I'll go for a drop. So every time you buckle up, throw up a big fat high five. On busy highways, I stay strapped in cause it's what's kept in mind. I got a safety R-I-E. Roughly 15,000 lives are saved by seatbelt usage every year. Three out of five people in car accidents could survive if they were wearing seatbelts. The national average for seatbelt usage is at 90.7%. It is. It's a great, great organization that's working directly with um, our Hillsborough County Schools, keeping our kids safe. So although Bloomingdale High School won the PSA of the year, Newsom High School had the highest overall score regarding their Buckle Up campaign. And so I want to acknowledge Newsom High School as well and all the other high schools that participated. Um, I also want to acknowledge that this last weekend was the um, Florida High School's Cheer States Competition. 
Our own Strawberry Crest won the states for the ninth year in a row. So congratulations to Strawberry Crest High School. Yeah. Um, several of our other high schools did very well, but Strawberry Crest definitely has a, a leader amongst. So um, thank you all. And I do want to take an extra opportunity. I know that, you know, we're kind of going into the home stretch of the next couple months. And our teachers are just working overtime. They're doing a phenomenal job. And we need to make sure that they understand that those of us that sit up here recognize that every single day that they are the heart and soul of our schools both the teachers and the administration. So thank you so very much for everything you do. Thank you, Member Rendon. Member Vaughn. Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to thank Kristen Davis for arranging our trip to Tallahassee. Um, we had really great meeting with legislators um, who were really engaged. Um, I had the honor of meeting legislators with member Perez who was a very strong advocate to talking about our teachers mental health mental health and asking our legislators to secure funding for our teachers with all the mental health funding that we get so much of it is allocated to our students which we greatly appreciate but she was a great advocate um, after we had a young teacher here talk about mental health to make sure that we're including our employees in that so um, I thought that was timely since we just had an employee speak about that they were really great meetings. Again, thank you, Kristen. You did an amazing job. Um, I, I think it's really important for people to stay engaged with legislation. That's why we craft a platform and why we go up and speak to our legislators. We had several people here today talk about HB1 and the effects of that, and I think it's really important that our community members and everyone here who came to speak passionately about boundaries in schools and are engaged in their students' well-being understand what that looks like and how that's going to affect our district and all of the legislation. I know it's it's thick legislation and sometimes it's hard to pay attention, but I urge all of the uh, families and our citizens who care greatly about our school district to definitely pay attention to legislation, especially that one. Um, Happy Black History Month. It's one of my favorite celebrations. Um, I actually had someone today, Allie Wilbur, uh, Turner Bartell, she's been a great advocate at that school, um, tell me that their PTSA uh, delivered um, buckets for each student to bring home books, 90 different classrooms containing all stories with black protagonists and a black, about black history and crayons that included all different skin colors. So it was really nice to see that and for her to reach out and that, share that with me. I've seen my schools doing great and amazing things. Um, I have had some teachers honestly reach out though with some concerns about what they can share and what they can't share. There is a fear right now of sharing black history and what that looks like. And I think it's really important um, that we're able to talk about and share um, our black history. Um, I, I took some letters to our legislators from our students here in Hillsborough County. Um, I had 48 different students sign on different letters about their priorities and I shared that. And one of the things that I didn't share that I think was really important, there were several letters from students talking about black history and how important seeing themselves in the stories and understanding where they came from has had such an impact and really afraid with what they've seen with AP history and talk of CRT and what that looks like for generations coming through. So not only is that a concern from our teachers and our staff, it's our students who want to prioritize that and have reached out to me too. So I think that's important as we talk about black history to talk about how much our, how much, what an impact it has on our students and how important it is. And one of my favorite, um, when we talk about black history, who I love to talk about is Langston Hughes and the whole Harlan Renaissance. And, you know, there's a quote that I often quote, um, which says, I swear to the Lord, I still can't see why democracy means everybody but me. And it's a reminder as we talk about democracy and freedom. And when we say the Pledge of Allegiance, that it's to all, to everyone. And everybody's history is just, is just as valuable and as important. So thank you for everybody who's celebrating black history. I'm really excited to see our district embrace it and everything happening in our schools. Um, and the only other thing I really want to talk about since we had so much conversation about boundaries tonight as I know the superintendent, when he sent out the workshop um, information, also sent out um, statistics that show the free and reduced lunch as well as the race to, uh, racial statistics. <laughs> I 
Um, and I'm just hoping every board member is looking at that and seeing the adjustments and what that looks like. So when we talk about equity and diversity, we have a really good understanding of what our proposed boundary changes look like for each school. Thank you for including that. That was a really eye-opening document. Um, and I hope everybody is really looking at that. And I hate to close on kind of a negative note, <laughs> but um, I do echo the sentiments of um, a lot of our speakers about our consulting company that we hired and the data that they've provided us with. Um, it has been, I think, since one community meeting that they've refused to engage with me and haven't talked to me, no matter how many times I've asked or tried to ask for data. Um, and I'm extremely frustrated about that. So I, you know, I really want us to all reflect on that when we are using this data, you know, how, how clear was it? Where did they draw it? I, I feel really disappointed that I can't get answers on that and it makes me suspicious of the data that they, they drew. So I, I hope that everybody is getting more answers than I am. <laughs> um, but that's it. Um, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Press? Yeah, this has been an amazing few weeks um, here. So um, first, Kristen did an amazing job um, with getting us around and through Tallahassee. She left me and Member Vaughn to our own devices for a while, and we were running through that, through, through the Capitol, um, and really enjoyed it. Um, but I did. I was um, advocating with whatever senator, um, you know, I was able to get any um, time with regarding funding. You know, up in Tallahassee, there were, we're talking in appropriations about mental health dollars. And I thanked whoever I, we were in front of regarding the um, money that's coming towards for our, our students um, for mental health. But I also um, spoke about our staff and our administration. We talk, I talked about the fact that um, our, um, the mental health of our teachers is, you know, at a crisis level. And if we don't have teachers in front of our students, then we don't have anything. And it's imperative for us to start addressing the mental health and wellness of not just our teachers, but the staff as well. You know, when I first came, when I first was elected in 2018, we had an incident where one of the security guards um, took out their, their family and took their own life. And since 2018, this well, this district, along with many other districts, have been very silent about the mental health and wellness of our teachers and staff. And it really needs to start um, coming to the surface. This conversation needs to be had. And so I took it upon myself to have that conversation while we were in Tallahassee. And um, I hope that people start listening I hope um, lawmakers start making a movement forward to help um, provide some mental health dollars to go towards um, the teachers and staff um, throughout the state of Florida um, and beyond, I hope. But um, so I just wanted to make sure that you heard that. Um, I also went to a Pro Dads um, event at Cham um, well, it actually was at Cleveland Elementary School. Um, the Chamberlain High, High School Alliance, um, Legacy Alliance, um, presented a $500 check to them. And um, if any one of you have ever, have never been to a Pro Dad event, um, I really suggest that you go. It was really neat to see the parents there. And there was a few parents that did not speak English, but they, they showed up and, you know, to support their students. So I had the opportunity to really have a conversation there with, with those parents in Spanish and, and English. Um, also, um, I want to send a shout out to my, my two of my grandchildren. I'm going to take a, a, a personal uh, point. Here, um, Olivia and Avery, they got into the National Elementary Honor Society. So I want to congratulate them. 
And then also, you know, at the um, Excellence Awards um, and Education Awards, you know, congratulations to all. But also, I ran into one of my college professors who is now retired and, you know, education, whether in high school, elementary school or middle school or college, you know, teachers always influence. And she was one of my biggest influencers to come in to become a therapist. So, you know, um, but that is my little report for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Member Perez. Um, just a couple items. I want to echo um, everyone who's really thanked Kristen Davis. She just did an amazing job. She is one of the most organized people I've ever met, and she really helped us you know, be organized so we could focus on our legislative priorities and not worry about the details, and we really appreciate that. I feel like I had some really great meetings, some really um, good connections, and I appreciate that. As many as, as many of you know, today is the opening of the Florida State Fair. I want to encourage everyone who visits the fair to stop by the Florida Center near Gate 1 and view the Hillsborough County Public School exhibits. Um, this year, school exhibits have returned to the exhibit area. For COVID, we didn't have them for many years. Um, and there's going to be many schools as well as departments, submitted proposals, and created really nice exhibits to showcase student work and some of the great experiences our district has to offer students. So please make sure when you go by there to make sure you see the exhibits. And I want to thank all the teachers, the staff, and the schools and the departments for putting forth all the effort and time to create those exhibits. Um, and then in closing, um, a couple weeks ago, I was able, since it's CTE month, I was able to attend a Future Career Academy event and spend the entire day on a bus with a group of students and visiting several different businesses. And it was just so exciting to see students and see the options. And really, the biggest thing for me was the hope that the students had. Students who walked in and they said, gosh, I didn't know what I was going to do, and I didn't realize a job like this was available. Um, this program has been highlighted on a lot of news stories, but I did want to show the last couple minutes, a clip from ABC Action News that had, a, there were several, but I really liked this one. So, um, Pablo, if you'll just cue that up. With three throughout January and February, thousands of students from all 32 Hillsborough County high schools have been taking field trips and visiting companies all across the country. This is all part of Future Career Academy's mission to give students the best opportunity to find a job right out of high school. Our ABC Action News reporter Robert Boyd followed along with them. Well, I'm with three students from King High School, and they just finished up a behind-the-scenes tour of Bausch & Lohm. Who knows? Maybe one of them will work here someday. On any given day, a bus full of high school seniors will pull up in front of one of more than 100 Hillsborough County companies eager to show and tell. We're very proud to be a, a community leader, and we want to open our doors to students that don't necessarily want to go to the next step of education. Ken Patton of Bosch & Loam said it's equally beneficial for their company. They always have entry-level positions they're trying to fill. We had really focused a lot of our attention on college graduates. Um, but the workforce is changing and we see it in front of us and we have to be able to adapt to it and being able to reach out to juniors and seniors in high school. The students got to wear the lab coat and safety glasses, walking the production floor, seeing firsthand what goes into operating a drug manufacturing facility. Like, I didn't even know that like this place was a place here like in Tampa. It's a big process when it comes to making pharmaceuticals. Like it's more than just making it and putting it in a box. I think it's really nice how you can start an entry level job and then they'll pay you to go to college. Many times they prejudge an industry or a brand and whenever they walk in and see really the types of jobs and career paths that are available in any company that they had no idea about, they're really shocked and surprised and excited. And when the Future Career Academy isn't organizing field trips, they are in the classroom, preparing students on how to enter the workforce and setting up job fairs. Are you always looking for new businesses to open up their doors to the students? Yes, if you have jobs, if you have opportunity for our students, we would love to connect. As for Bosch and Loam, they can't wait for the next busload of seniors. Can you think of any students in the past who actually went through this program and then came back to work here? Yes, we actually have two. So it so is a success. It is a success. In Tampa, Robert Boyd, ABC Action News. Um, thank you, everyone, and this meeting is adjourned. Have a nice evening.